This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Friends, welcome to virtual worship. It is a gift to be able to gather with you in this way, in this hour. We gather in the name of the God of perfect love and are told by the scriptures that perfect love casts out all fear. We are grateful for the presence of the Holy Spirit that is impervious to the bounds of geography and time, uniting us with that love that makes us one. So as we transition from arriving here to being here, let us pray. Holy God, we praise you that by your Spirit's power we are united as your church. So let your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Where our hearts are restless, O Lord, help us rest in you. We pray this in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Our reading comes from John chapter 4, starting in the fifth verse. Listen now to God's word. So Jesus came to a Samaritan city called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. His disciples had gone into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Jews do not share things in common with the Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his son and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give them will spring up like a river gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. What you say is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ. When he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then, the disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with a woman, but no one said, what do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left her water jar and went back to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who has told me everything I have ever done. He cannot be the Messiah, can he? Many Samaritans in that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world. Here ends our reading. This is the word of God for the people of God. The word binary, apart from its mathematical connotations, means something having two parts or involving two things. In ways, our minds tend to be very binary in their thinking. 
We tend to operate within binary frameworks, sometimes struggling against mystery in our need to have order and understanding. We tend to apply binary ways of thinking to other people, content to neatly categorize and relate to others based on our associations with the category, rather than remembering that relationships and people are unique. They require a boutique approach, not big box solutions or ways of thinking about them. There are obvious examples of the way that we do this, of course. Duke, Carolina, Republican, Democrat, documented, undocumented, justice involved, not justice involved, old, young, employed, unemployed. And as we face down a COVID-19 pandemic, infected, not infected, in person, remote or virtual. Duke Divinity School professor Chuck Campbell, in speaking to the group of 60 folks who gathered for the second in our five-part Sunday School series about how we might be more intentionally welcoming to the LGBTQ community, spoke about this disposition. Not only our minds, but the ancient mind of the biblical authors were binary in their thinking, binary in the language that they used. But then along comes Jesus and challenges us to transcend the distinctions, to open our minds to the mystery of God and the depth and the complexity of the human experience and community, saying things like, at the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage, and prompting Paul, who had been notoriously rigid in his thinking and categories, to say to the Galatians that now there is no longer Jew nor Greek, no longer slave nor free, no longer male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. And so it is that we too must open ourselves up to the liberation that Jesus offers us and others when he transcends the distinctions and tells us that evidencing the kingdom is about doing the same. The conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well is a snapshot of his propensity for throwing concern for the categories out the door in favor of getting to the real issue at hand, so much so that the disciples are aghast when they see him and this woman talking together alone. In a breath, he throws out concern for her many husbands, waves away one of the central theological rifts between Jews and Samaritans, where God's presence might be found on a holy mountain or in a holy city. And he says, let me tell you about spirit and truth and what it means to really worship. I'll tell you that living with a preschooler helps loosen up the muscle of surrender when it comes to trying to transcend a binary mindset. Every day I learn from our little boy what it means to lighten up on the rigidity of my categories and efforts to make everything fit in its proper place. For instance, in our house, it is perfectly normal for a T-Rex to battle with a Star Wars at at Walker. The sun occasionally oversleeps and mayonnaise was made to be eaten on a spoon. I was informed just yesterday that a king cobra could best the coronavirus in a duel any day. And I have to say, it feels pretty good to be liberated from my need to make everything fit in its place. We're gathering for worship remotely at a time when the distinctions among us and between us are getting a lot of airtime in binary ways. Who is in and who is out of the borders of countries closing for containment? Who is quarantined on account of infection or risk and whose movements are free? Who has enough toilet paper and who does not? Only the power of a global pandemic could outpace the political campaign season in this regard. But even though we are separated by geography, as a family of faith, we are united by God in spirit and truth. And in these strange and anxious and trying times, we are united by our identity as the church, regardless of if we worship in person or apart, come to the beautiful building at the corner of Trinity Avenue and Gregson Streets, or stay away. The church 
is a people, not a place, a people of spirit and truth. So let us dig deep and open ourselves up wide in new ways in the weeks ahead to the liberation that Jesus offers us and others when he transcends the distinctions that would divide God's people and tells us that evidencing the kingdom is about doing the same. And let's take up every tool at our fingertips, email, phone lines, social media, the U.S. Postal Service, deeds of socially distanced service, and prayer for one another and for our community. Let's take up every one of these tools at our fingertips to foster one another's connection to the church, not as a place, but as a people a people who are disinterested in the binary distinctions that would divide us, a people set free by Jesus to live in spirit and truth. Let us pray. Holy God, in the shifting sands of these tenuous days, help us to be as we are as your church, people of spirit and truth. Bless us as we seek to find fresh expressions of this blessed reality in our life together and in our community. Quiet our minds when alarmed, alarming voices rise that we may be still. When uncertainty abounds, fill our hearts with love and trust. Christ as a light, illumine and guide the thinkers that are working on vaccinations and cures. Christ as a shield, overshadow public health workers and public servants the world order over and protect the vulnerable. Christ under us, be the solid ground on which we stand when our knees tremble. Christ over us, keep our attention focused on you and our vocation of sharing your love. Christ beside us on our left and on our right, supply the needs of those struggling to make ends meet at a time when we are told to store up more. Accompany the hearts of those who are lonely. Transform anxious isolation into blessed solitude with you. Strengthen the ties that bind us by any and every means that every person would know they are not alone. This day be within the hearts of the grieving, consoling them with resurrection hope. This day be without us, moving in places we cannot reach to accomplish abundantly far more than all that we could ever ask for or imagine. Holy and meek yet all-powerful one, stretch out your hand and bring healing, collaboration, and peace in our households, in our city, in this country, and in every land. Help us transcend the distinctions that would divide us. Hearten us that in this time of social distancing, we don't leave the church, but we go out of our familiar places and pathways to be the church to the glory of your matchless name. We receive the words of your encouragement through that great hymn of our faith, rooted in Psalm 4610, Be still and know that I am God. Be still, my soul, the Lord is on thy side. Bear patiently the cross of grief or pain. Leave to thy God to order and provide, who through all changes faithful will remain. Be still, my soul, thy best, thy heavenly friend, through thorny ways, leads to a joyful land. Be still, my soul, thy God doth undertake to guide the future surely as the past. Thy hope, thy confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul, the waves and winds still know. 
His voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. Be still, my soul, the hour is hastening on. When we shall be forever with the Lord. When disappointment, grief, and fear are gone, sorrow for God, love's purest joys restored. Be still, my soul. When change and tears are past, all safe and blessed, we shall meet at last. Amen. Remember now, we have not left the church. We've gone out to be the church. Go forth into this day, grounded in hope, filled with joy to love and serve the Lord in every single thing that you do and abide always in God's peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, both now and forevermore. Amen.